so we are here at Kennish Town, sat here with the legend, the iconic Moni Love. Before we even ask questions, I just want to say one thing, Moni. You're the reason, you and Cookie Crew are the reason why we're here. You're, you're the reason why, the, do you understand the legacy that you left, that you started in regards to when you guys came out in the 80s? I don't think I fully understand that. Okay. I, I think that my humility doesn't allow me to fully understand that, okay. if you know what I mean. Okay, so I grew up watching um, Moni on television, watching I Can Do This video, watching uh, you know Grandma's <laughs> House, watching you and Della Soul. Eventually I'd grow, I'd grow up in that so you get to meet Maceo and them guys. But, right. but knowing, seeing you come from the UK and being part of the UK hip hop community and then go to America, was absolutely inspirational for a lot of us. And though, you know, in the UK we don't say it, I just want to say it on camera. Wow. Thank you, brother. Wow. Thank you. That's, I never thought of it that way. That's awesome. Like, that's, yeah. that's awesome. Because I sit, you know, I see, this is one of my little younglings, you know? Like, <laughs> we, we see what you're yeah. doing, and right. you, you know, you're still very much connected mm -hmm. with the older heads in the hip hop community mm -hmm. in England, such mm -hmm. as Business and Swifty and Pogo and. You know, so it's definitely, that's great to hear coming from you. Yeah, you're the reason why a lot of us are here. <coughs> a lot awesome. of us do it because we saw that someone could actually do it. So we're going to go, let's go back to the beginning. Yeah. How did you start? How did it all start off for you? Honestly, um, we, <coughs> excuse me, we started uh, simulating, gathering ourselves together, North London, West London, East London, South London, gathering ourselves together and forming crews in different areas of London and simulating what was going on in the United States. And we were simulating it based on what we were watching on um, wild style movies and breaking and Beat Street and these sorts of things. And we, we came to understand what was going on in the United States with the emerging hip hop culture and hip hop music genre. So we formulated the same thing in England based off of what we saw going on in the United States and um, we had real live crews in every corner in every pocket of the country and it spread out so it spread outside London it spread into the suburbs it spread into Paris and Italy and um, everywhere and it wasn't just people rapping it was people break dancing it was the graffiti it was the whole thing the culture right. is what Evolve. The culture is what we formulated. We took a page out of the book of what was what the cultural explosion of hip hop was happening in the United States, and we created a pseudo world here, completely formulated of what was going on there. So it was all aspects of hip hop culture. The music is just a fragment of it. So you had the MCs. You had honestly, <coughs> if I'm honest, we were all break dancing and body popping first. Oh yeah. We were all breaking and body popping first. We were either in Charing Cross Tube Station, breaking, popping, or what have you, in, in um, Covent Garden, right? We would go to uh, Spats on Tottenham Court Road where Tim Westwood used to play on a lunchtime on Saturdays for like two hours, <laughs> right? But that's all we had, so we went. Then when shows would come to the country and play at places like Town and Country Club, which is now the Forum, mm -hmm. or Electric Ballroom, you know, we would go to those places and dance and battle each other and, and it was really for real. And then, as anything evolves, it evolved into some of the breakers became DJs, like business, like DJ Cutmaster Swift. They they were bona fide, they bona fide B-boys first. And then they evolved into DJs. I, Body Papa, Pop Larkin, evolved into being an MC. Pogo, another DJ from Breaking, evolved into that. Do you know what I mean? So it's like we all evolved into, and that's not just us. Everybody in the hip hop community, in you know, that followed the culture, branded off into something else. Some other area still related. So, um, thank you, <coughs> so yeah. moving on, your first hit, which was uh, for me, was I can do this. Right. And then obviously, you know, you had uh, it's a shame and all those things. You moved to America. What happened? How how did that how did that feel to, to be accepted? Oh. And you know, because you bless basically you started the legacy of of seeing collaborations like you and Buddy and right. the ladies first record we have to talk about. Right. I um 
basically wanted to be respected by everybody that I looked up to. And in order to do that, I felt like I had to throw myself in the lion's den. So I um, was fortunate enough to have a split deal, um, which created the circumstance for me to do that. And half of my album was record recorded in England under Christmas Cool Tempo, Blake Lama signed to. And I had a joint venture deal with Warner Brothers, so half of my record deal was also with Warner Brothers for the United States and Canada. So when I went to the US to record that half of my album, I had already become acquainted with uh, the Jungle Brothers and with Queen Latifah from when they previously had come over with Funk and Klein. Do you remember Funk and Klein, Dave Klein, that used to bring all the acts over? He was like the ambassador, rest in peace. He was the hip hop ambassador that would bring groups from the United States over to England to perform. And we would all pack a little hole in the wall called Ding Walls to see these shows. Exactly, okay, and it was the coolest spot ever like we did we don't we didn't care about fancy decor and stuff like that then all we cared all we cared about was that oh my gosh uh there's the the bill that's on tonight at dingwalls oh what is it it's true mathematics chill rob g queen latifah and the jungle brothers you know what i mean so we was just like oh in there so how did um, the song with Latifah come about? Because that to me is a monumental... Latifah and I met that night at Dingwalls. Wow. That night at Dingwalls, Latifah and I met and we struck up a friendship. The song Ladies First is not in today's collaboration uh, standards as one person's manager calling another person's manager like these artists should do a song together and blah blah blah. The song Ladies First is a real live depiction of friendship on record. Do you still, do you That's guys what do, it is. Do you guys I honestly, I haven't spoken to Latifah in a good two and a half years. No, more than two and a half years. A good eight years or so. Okay. When she when she went to Hollywood, and I'm not saying that to say, oh, she went to Hollywood. Life separates you. Yeah. I have four children. I sometimes I can't keep up with whether I washed this bag of laundry or if I didn't. Much less keep up with where Latifah is. And Latifah has a million and one responsibilities with being her own celebrity self and having her own TV show and her own projects and also running and being head of a functioning television and movie production house that is constantly churning out TV shows and movies and trying to do the next thing, you know? Because a lot of people don't realize that bringing down the house with Latifah and Steve Martin, which was hilarious, okay? That's under Latifah's movie house. That's her company. You know so what I'm saying? A, she's, she's just powerhouse the whole thing. Absolutely, she's powerhouse there. Okay. You know? So life kind of can sometimes put a fork in the road where people don't get to keep up with each other as much as they'd like to. Two years ago, she got on a radio station that I had just three weeks previous quit. She didn't know that. She got up there and she got on the mic and was like, Where's Moni? I came up here to see Moni and I didn't hear it, but everybody started calling me like, turn the radio on! Do you know that there was a furore online when the, the Jeezy comment happened? I heard that there was blood fire and oh hailstones and everything in England. I heard so everybody went ballistic. In a nutshell, uh, Young Jeezy kind of made a, uh, took a pot shot at Moni and suggested she was not important or something along those lines. And right. it was... Yeah, it was ugly. It was ugly. Like, we, I remember I had to do interviews online where people were phoning me <laughs> for podcasts on internet stations saying, so how do you feel? I was like, well, UK-wise, we're annoyed, bro. You have to pump it up a little bit. You know what I mean? Because, you know, it's, you're, yeah. you're, you're a queen and it's like, it's really, you're one of the the main people. And I'm not guessing you. Somebody had to show me yeah, a yeah, bunch yeah. of stuff for yeah. me to realise. Like, I did not know that England got so upset. I didn't even know it reached. Because Jeezy's not even hot over here. so you I know, didn't even know it to, reached. He's not really doing it. He's not about that right here. So it's like for you to be doing that, it's just not happening. It just was, honestly, the radio station that I worked for, Jeezy was a guest one day, and it was during the time when um, Nas's Hip Hop Is Dead album was about to come out. And Jeezy was offended with the whole Hip Hop Is Dead title and concept, and he felt like it was a diss towards all the new guys that are um, making songs, making records and making albums now. He felt like, who is Nas to say that hip hop is dead? And I basically had to remind him, <clears throat> um, Nas is somebody that's been here for an extremely long amount of time. He's, he's actually somebody that was an apprentice 
in the game yeah. under the people before him and excel to be a prolific MC. So he's got a right to say that. Yeah. But I know it's online on Twitter that every now and then you'll kind of come and answer stuff. Every things. now and then? Yeah, you, you, you know, I mean, I'm not. You can I'm be honest. No, I'm you not, can I'm be honest. stalking your Twitter. No, no, no. Yeah. You can be honest. Yeah. I speak my mind a lot. You speak your mind. That's where I was going. I was trying yeah, to Yeah, you can be honest. He was, he was being very gracious and yeah. saying, sometimes, no, so, you can say it. Yeah. I go so, in. I know. You go in and one of the things I really like about you going in is you, you really make a point of highlighting that, yo, this thing's going in the wrong direction. Certain things are not necessary. This is not cool. How do we get to this point? So I want to take this time to give you the platform to speak about what your, what your concerns are about hip hop in general, okay. about the music in general. It's very key that in the beginning of this interview, you and I spoke about the culture first and the music being a spawn of the culture. The culture came first. Always remember that. So when you get to a point where the culture is now something that's not even referred to anymore and people don't know it, don't remember it, don't try to go back, because these cats, a lot of them, minus the exceptions such as Kendrick. Kendrick is a baby, clearly the spawn of hip hop culture. Yeah, clearly, clearly. Okay, and you can see that just by looking at his album cover for, for the, the last album. Yeah. You can see it, right? Because the whole scene in that album cover looks like a shot from Boys in the Hood, which we all know comes again from hip hop yeah. culture. Ken, mixed, making, you understand? Kendrick's making clever choices. Okay, so he's making clever choices and it, 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 we see the, the connection between the culture and the music spawned from the culture in what Kendrick's doing. Unfortunately, this is not the same story that we can set, tell over and over and over for a plentiful amount of artists that are putting music out today. Now, with that being said, doing music or doing anything that is completely unrelated to the culture from that of which it comes from is like carrying an empty water bottle. There's no water in it. You got the bottle, which means you got the idea. But when you're thirsty, you're but done. But there's, there's no water in it. There's no water in it and water is the source of life. The culture drives the authenticity of the music in any music, in any music, okay? When you saw an explosion with the grunge movement, happening at the top of the 90s with with Nirvana and, and, and with um, Soundgarden mm -hmm. and with all of these groups that came out of Seattle that was like one big freaking one big melting pot of, of, of artists that were sitting around each other feeding off of each other and it spawned a revolution within music progressive rock ch it changed the face of progressive rock forever mm -hmm. right hip-hop is the same thing so therefore, you cannot make hip hop music if you do not fill the water up from the well of hip hop culture. There's no easier way I can say it. Thank you, Molly. Um, we got going now. But yeah. Quickly, we should ask you, what's next for Molly? Uh, what's next for Molly is an EP, um, more touring, and bringing more friends back too. Cool. This is this show today is just to the iceberg. Okay. So more friends. Cool. All right. Kane's gonna actually be here in in May. You, you make sure you come interview Kane, cool. right? All right? And you tell him I said that you are supposed to ask him 50 million questions. You're gonna ask him about the uh, hip hop, the hip hop questions about, about Yeah, that. ask him about the-, the How the, he felt about Moni when he was younger. There you go. <laughs> Do that. All right, <laughs> No problem.